So, uh, Jocelyn, are you uh, next up to present? So, uh, in the next section, we'll discuss the sympathetic turf field exposure model. Uh, let me introduce our staff toxicology of OEHA, Dr. Jocelyn Clark. Okay, thank you. Waiting for the slides. Okay, good morning. Uh, so in this section, um, we'll talk about the synthetic turf field exposure model. Uh, so I'll briefly review the exposure pathways that we will consider in our assessment and give a brief summary of the time activity study Patty mentioned that was conducted. Then I'll move on to discuss the equations that we'll use to estimate exposure dose, the parameters that will go into there, and the data that we'll use to derive their values. So here shows a timeline of the development of the exposure scenario development. Uh, this little line shows where we are today. So we're here at this meeting. Uh, we're gonna discuss how the data we gathered will be used. A little background on the study. We have collaborated with UC Berkeley and the University of Arizona to conduct study with IRB approved study protocols and designs. Uh, data was collected from soccer players via a survey and videotaping. Um, in late 2017 to early 2018. The reports from those studies can be found in the meeting materials appendix where they have more information on the protocols that were used and more information about the data itself. So this slide just provides a quick summary of what was collected. So we had 1,069 participants, com participants complete our online survey and in-person questionnaire. We had nearly equal numbers of males and females, ages four to 71 years old, um, and from multiple ethnicities. We received responses from athletes who play in each of the four main soccer positions, which are forward, defender, midfielder, and goalkeeper. The questions captured information on how often they play or practice, and on-field activities such as how often they dive, slide, or fall. Also information on their warm-up activities and exertion levels during activity, which is how much time they spend resting versus running around on the field. Um, we also collected information about their history, um, including like when they started to play. 40 of those participants also participated in the video study. Uh, the age of these participants was from seven to 22 years old, half were male, half were female, almost equally distributed amongst the four soccer positions. Um, and we have video from an equal number of practices and games. So participants were videotaped through the course of an entire practice or game, and the video data were analyzed to gather information on their contact frequency and duration with the field and other objects, such as water bottles or hand-to-mouth activity. Analysis also noted how often they fall, slide, or dive, and data in the video also were also analyzed for exertion levels. So these data are used to derive the parameters for the inhalation, ingestion, and dermal pathways, um, as you can see shown here. So this slide shows the conceptual site map of the exposures that may occur on the field. Last year at our meeting, we went into more detail about each pathway and the field user categories that are considered for each pathway. Um, more, meeting, more details can be found in the meeting materials, but briefly I'll just summarize what we're looking at here. Um, so the synthetic turf field components, including the crumb rubber, the backing, and the grass blades are considered as the sources of exposure. And through various um, media and environmental activities, um, exposure can occur through inhalation, dermal, or ingestion pathways. The inhalation exposure is shown here in yellow. Um, this occurs when chemical vapors or airborne partic particulates from the field are breathed in. Dermal exposure is shown in blue. Um, and this occurs when chemicals are transferred from the crumb rubber onto the skin and are absorbed. This can be a direct mechanism through with direct skin, talk, skin contact with the crumb rubber um, or indirectly where chemicals or particles get transferred onto the skin from another object. Ingestion is shown in green and this occurs when crumb rubber particles get into the mouth and are ingested. It can be, an accident, it can be a direct pathway where ingestion is accidental or intentional and it may also be indirect where chemicals or particles get transferred um, into the mouth through a carrier such as a hand or an object. 
now we'll move on to how exposure dose um, will be estimated and how we'll use the exposure data to do that. So an exposure dose is the estimated amount of chemical that is experienced by a field user as a result of activity. Shown here at the top is the general skeleton of the dose equation. The dose is equal to a concentration in media times the intake rate times the time spent on field. So chemical concentrations in air and crumb rubber, um, including bioaccessibility measurements, will be measured in the field study and will be used for the concentration parameter values. Different media will be covered at different pathways. Air concentrations will be used for inhalation and crumb rubber chemical concentrations will be used for ingestion and dermal pathways. The intake rates are derived from the available data in the literature and the time activity study. Um, different pathways will have different factors for this parameter. So you'll have breathing rate for, for inhalation, ingestion rate for ingestion, and then dermal loading for dermal exposures. Considerations will be made um, for parameters that may be affected by age, gender, um, or the field user category. Exposure times are derived from the data gathered in the survey. Um, this is the time spent on field by the field users. Considerations will also be made for age, gender, and field user type um, in the development of this parameter. Once calculated, the exposure dose will be used to estimate the non-cancer hazard and cancer risk for a chemical. I will briefly go over how those calculations will be made and how the dose will be used, but the main focus of our discussion will be on the specific dose equations um, for the pathways that we will consider and the development of the parameters. So shown here is the general skeleton of the hazard quotient equation. Um, the hazard quotient of a chemical is the ratio of the non-cancer dose uh, to a chronic reference level, or REL as it's shown here. The cancer dose corresponds to a daily exposure of a chemical, and the chronic reference exposure level is a daily intake amount at or below which no adverse non-cancer health effects are anticipated to occur. This level is designed to be protective for continuous long-term exposures. Shown here is the general skeleton for the cancer risk equation. The cancer risk for a chemical is an prob estimated probability of adverse human health effects occurring um, from exposure to a chemical. The risk is equal to the non-cancer dose times a potency factor times an age sensitivity factor times an exposure duration over an averaging time. The cancer dose represents a lifetime exposure dose of a chemical. The pot cancer potency factor is used to estimate the increased risk of a chemical in an exposed population from a lifetime exposure to that chemical. Age sensitivity factors are weighted factors that consider the increased sensitivity to carcinogens during prenatal and early postnatal life stages as compared with adult life stages. The exposure duration is the years of exposure and the averaging time is the period over which that exposure duration is averaged. So now we'll get into each specific pathways equations. So we'll start with the inhalation pathway. So the non-cancer exposure concentration for inhalation is shown here. This is a special scenario that applies for this pathway. As you can see, this equation does not follow the general format that we just discussed. Typically, concentration values for long-term near continuous exposures, such as with a ex residential scenario, um, are considered for the chronic inhalation non-cancer assessment. This, however, is not the case with synthetic turf field users. They are only on or near the field for a few hours a day, for a few days per week. Um, so for this reason, an adjusted concentration of a chemical is used to estimate exposure for the partial period of the day that they are on the field. This parameter is derived by multiplying the concentration <coughs> of a chemical in air that was measured in the field study by the exposure time. And the values for exposure time are derived from the survey data that I previously discussed. Shown here are the values for athletes that we received in the survey data. Differences are found between gender and age, and the data are separated based on the season and for practices versus games. Presented here are the median and 95th percentiles only, but the full range of the dis data distribution can be found in the meeting materials. So limited data was collected on the younger age group from two to six, but you can see that the essential tendency for other players is to spend about one to two hours per day on a field for either practices or games, and higher estimates range from about two to six hours per day 
These are the exposure times for coaches, referees, and bystanders. No data was collected on these groups from the survey data, but WEHA has made assumptions about how they're anticipated to behave, and then the data for athletes was used to derive these values. So coaches are assumed to be on the field anytime the players are on the field for both practices and games, and referees are assumed to be on the field during games anytime the athletes are. For these two groups, the responses for all survey participants were analyzed to estimate the exposure times. Child bystanders, bystanders are assumed to be present at the fields during practices and games of older siblings. Data for survey participants ages four to 16 were used to derive their exposure times. The adult bystanders are assumed to be present at the practices of, game, at the practices of children ages four to 16 and at all games. So data for partic survey participants ages four to 16 was used to derive exposure time for practices and then data for all the participants was used to derive the exposure time for games. So this equation here shows the, the estimation of cancer exposure dose for inhalation. Uh, you can see this equation follows the general format that we talked about. You have a concentration, an intake rate, and an exposure time. Uh, we just discussed the air concentration. So next, the inhalation absorption fraction. This represents the fraction of the dose that is absorbed. In the absence of chemical-specific data, we will assume a value of one according to our guidelines. The values for the inhalation rate normalized to body weight are adopted from OEHA guidelines. Those values are presented here as they are found in the guidelines. These rates are calculated in consideration that different levels of activity will require different levels of energy expenditure and will thus affect the inhalation rate. We recognize that field users may engage in various levels of activity. Athletes may engage in activities that involve resting or standing, light activities such as walking, moderate activities such as jogging, and high activities such as running. Coaches and referees are anticipated to engage in resting, light, and moderate activities while bystanders are anticipated to engage in resting and light activities. And just a note, uh, the age groups presented here are unique to this pathway based on the availability of the inhalation data. Um, the age groups for the inhalation and derma will be, we will use our traditional WEHA age groups. So back to our main equation, the exertion level here represents the percentage of time on the field that a user spends performing activity at a specific intensity level. Data from the survey will be used to, as to derive this parameter value. We, are, we already talked about the exposure time. So next, the exposure frequency. This represents the days per week um, spent on the field by field users. Survey data is also used um, to estimate this parameter value. So shown here is the data um, collected on exertion level in the survey from the athletes. Um, once again, the median 95th are presented here. The full range can be found in the meeting materials. Differences were found between gender and age. And again, the data are separated by activity intensity and for practices versus games. Um, limited data was collected on the youngest age groups once again. Um, and you can see the range of the data for each of the groupings vary within the group. So exertion values for coaches, referees, and bystanders. No data was collected for these groups. So once again, OEHA has made assumptions about how they are anticipated to behave. Coaches are assumed to spend practices walking around and jogging on the field while they are anticipated to be standing, walking, and jogging on the sidelines during games. Referees are not assumed to be present during the practices, but are assumed to spend time during games standing, walking, and jogging. For both practices and games, child bystanders are assumed to be sitting or walking around on the field sidelines, while adult bystanders are assumed to be sitting watching the field activities. So this table here shows the exposure frequency data that was collected in the survey. Once again, differences between gender and age, and the data are separated by season and for practices versus games. Players tend to spend one to two days per week on the field for practices and games each. Higher estimates range from two to six days. So here shows the exposure frequency values for coaches, referees, and bystanders. 
no data were collected for these groups, but we have made the same assumptions as we made for exposure times to derive these values. And so now um, we're gonna pause, we'll have a short discussion and ask the panel if they have any questions or input um, for the background and inhalation we just discussed. So I'll turn it back over to Dr. Bob. So thank you, Jocelyn. Uh, any comments or questions from the panel at this point? I'll turn to my left first, Dr. Bennett. I just had a clarifying question. Are we talking about the toxicity values and, and how those are being selected at a later point today? Because they're sort of in there, assuming we have them for all of the chemicals, and I didn't know if that was a point of discussion for later. Uh, no, we won't talk about any toxicity values at this meeting. Okay. As we are still developing the chemical list, uh, we, we are, that we, the toxicity criteria and the value will be discussed in the late in the future meetings. Okay. And okay. And so at that point, we'll also talk about how we'll sum up against across multiple chemicals and so forth. Yeah. Okay. Great. And then I just had a question on some of the extreme values in the pamphlet that you gave us. I mean, they had people reporting 24 hours on the field. So. <laughs> <laughs> It's just like one person that didn't get the survey or? Yeah, that's, and that's one of our questions for discussion that we like your input on. So we did receive, you know, like seven days per week or 24 hours per day. So it's kind of like, how do we handle those values? We don't know if it's seven days a week this, seems this realistic. Question. But. Yeah. So how do we put a limit on what's reasonable, you know, to consider? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we recognize that we do have some extreme values and how do we particularly handle them? And then I had a question on the slide for the third trimester. You showed the moderate breathing rate. I'm assuming that's a pregnant bystander. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And why wouldn't they be light? So the breathing rate during pregnancy, it's derived from the moderate activities of okay. someone 16 to 30 years old, because based on physiological differences that occur during pregnancy, that your breathing rate would kind of, yeah. And then my final question is on, um, is there any consideration that a lot of times the referees are also players? So it might be like a referee that's Yeah, so when we do, like, an as team. you mentioned, like when we talk about when we do multiple chemicals, when we get to doing the risk assessment, if they participate in more than one user category at the same, you know, at the same time or previously and earlier in life, we'll take that into consideration. Okay, well. great. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi, this is Linda Sheldon. Um, I may be asking questions that um, were answered in one of the previous SABs, but um, I would like some clarification. So first of all, what is the goal of this exposure assessment? Because whether it's to do a risk assessment for all populations that are near crumb tires is different than do we want to distinguish differential exposures between soccer you know soccer players in an epi study and you know in an epi study i think and this is out of my out of my area of expertise but i think you want to be able to understand differential exposures and therefore adults and kids and and the players might not be on the field at the same time if it's merely for a risk assessment it might be different and so again i think what we do depends upon what the goals are the other thing is is that um as you look at your task of assessing feasibility for um, for bio, biomarker studies, et cetera, I think that you need to say, um, you know, what am how how am I seeing it for groups differently also? So I think that that's really an important thing. I also think that, um, and again, I don't know if this is appropriate or not, but um, you are focusing exclusively on the soccer field. And I think that at some point, you need to estimate exposures that are non-soccer related relative to the rest of the population, because you may find that these exposures are not any greater than some of the other exposures. Um, you know, 
in our experience, diet is always a very important exposure. And again, it doesn't mean that it's that you need to do it here for looking for, for turf related. But I think what you need to understand is again, what risk is coming from, from, from that. Again, I don't, want, I don't want at the end of the day for you to see exposures for soccer players and not have it normalized to something else. And so that's really the point. Um, the last thing is, is that on the dose, depending upon how the, you know, what route and pathway it is, not only will it have a different dose, but it may be hitting a different target organ. I think PAH is a really good example of this. Inhalation exposure for PAHs can lead to cancer and lung cancer, but dietary ingestion, which is often much higher, um, you know, goes immediately to the gut and is, um, is transformed. So I think that as you look at dose, you need to understand what the target is going to be and do the different routes make any difference. Um, that's pretty much what I have. Thanks. Uh, Ed? Oh, and hi. Before I, I turn over the um, floor to you, Ed, I would like to uh, have uh, Dr. Amy Kyle introduce herself. Speak. Speak. I'm Dr. Amy Kyle. I'm sorry I was late. Glad to be here. And Dr. Kyle was my uh, colleague for many years at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, so Mr. Avel. Th thank you, John. Uh, I have a couple of questions just about the, uh, the layout and the, the planning on this, and I apologize if these were questions that were addressed in earlier, earlier sessions, but it seems like they're going to be germane as you move on. So going back, rolling back to even to figure 4.1, um, your athletes uh, and, you know, sort of what were in the pathways and what were considered unimportant, et cetera. Um, the, uh, on the athlete, the first table on the, oops, we're spinning back there. Oops, sorry for, okay. So the first column, an athlete. Um, these were, uh, were these validated or based on any uh, video data yet, or were these just sort of, con you know, sat down and sort of conjectured before you went out, sort of proposed before you went out to the field and actually visualized this? Because I'm, I guess I'm, my question has to do with the sort of the X's for the athlete, and in, you know, the particularly two of the three X's. So last year when we presented it, and it was kind of this is what we think will happen, but based on that and the video data that we received in the exposure study, we did update it so pathways that we didn't see occurring, the check or X may have changed. So this is validated based on what you actually captured yes, in the field? Yes, based on what okay. we've done after looking okay. at the video and exposure Good. studies. Thank you. Um, and then uh, in terms, uh, uh, in a similar way, the, the exposure times that were assumed, the hour or two hours, et cetera, were those also, th those are just collected by survey, but then were those reviewed or sort of validated by some sort of reality check based on what you saw in the videos that you collected? So the exposure time, we didn't um, collect in the video data, we didn't collect any information on exposure time, that was just in the survey, like Debbie mentioned from the, um, extreme values we have. So the data presented is just analyze what we have. Like some, it, I think the question, it was actually as you type in the number, so if people accidentally maybe put more than seven or more than 24, those data values were definitely kind of ruled out as kind of might be, in, those are incorrect. You can't right. have more than 24 hours. I mean, I guess I, I mean, I certainly agree with but, Debbie that yeah. people are unlikely to spend 24 hours yeah. on the field. Uh, but <laughs> but not, so, notwithstanding yeah. that outlier, it seemed to me that uh, based on the experience that I've seen and my children, et cetera, playing mm -hmm. soccer, that the, the, some of the values, particularly for the values of, you know, uh, teens and young adults in terms of competitive sports or club soccer or whatever, uh, some of those hours seem low. And, and so I'm just curious if, you know, what was based on, whether people were under-reporting or if, you know, some review of that was made because it seemed like uh, one can easily envision uh, a scenario in which uh, 
teenagers or, or young adults or, well, actually not even teenagers, but any anybody playing in the club sports system, for example, so we talk about 10-year-olds on up uh, through high school into college on uh, weekly uh, matches, weekly co uh, competitions, there might be two or three matches in the course of a day as they work their way through a competition. So they would spend for each of those matches uh, an hour or two on the field at a time. So one would expect that there might be six or seven hours, you know, sort of showing up rather than the two or three that were reported. And that could be maybe possibly what we have. We do have those six hour values, what people are reporting. Maybe they do have multiple games in a particular day. The survey was asked them in the past year. So if that occurred in the past year, they may have, that may be why it's recorded as six um, hours per day, but we don't, we don't know. Okay. Could, could I just interrupt for a second? Yeah. Uh, I think in addition to raising important issues like we're doing, uh, it would be helpful if we could provide some advice about how to deal with these difficult uh, okay. issues Fair too. Enough. Thank you. That's to all the panel, not just point, you, Ed. Point well taken, <laughs> yeah, point taken. Um, I guess the in terms of recommendation, it seems like the, the obvious one would be to sort of maybe validate that by the actual video that you have. If, if, if it's already been done by the University of Arizona, they might provide feedback, but otherwise I'm not sure how you go back and correct it. I'm, again, there's obviously going to be some editing with regard to the 24 hours, seven day a week sort of aspect. Um, but the, the ones that are sort of within the range of feasibility, it's much harder to, to know how to, how to treat those. Um, uh, let's see. I, I guess the, just the other observation, I was a little surprised by the male to female differences that I guess were reported. Um, I have both boys and girls, daughters and sons that have played and, you know, in the club system, there really wasn't much differentiation sort of how much time they were on the field. And yet, what you see reported is different. So I, I thought it was an interesting observation. I'm, I don't have a recommendation for that. It just I was surprised that it seemed like women were had, had less time sort of being reported. <laughs> but I think uh, I think those are all my uh, all my comments. With the with one other comment, that in terms of this report being released and accessible, and this obviously reflects a lot of information, uh, just to make sure that there are units provided for the tables and data that, uh, you know, in, in all the appropriate places to help the reader to follow along. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Dr. McCone? Oh, I, yes, I want to pick up on, and, and I think uh, Dr. Sheldon has made some key points. I'm sort of picking up on these in terms of the pass off of information. So I think the exposure assessment is pretty focused uh, and, and probably correctly so on what goes into somebody. But, and, and actually the exposure dose is a rate during some exposure time, which we're learning is some activity. I think where I, I think there's a need to be very careful and, and, and maybe carry more information is in the pass off to the risk assessment. And again, we're not reviewing that, but the way you presented it is you just go from the, the exposure dose, which is the you know, milligrams per kilogram or milligrams per day uh, that's passed off to a comparison to either um, uh, a REL, um, reference exposure limit uh, for non-cancer or uh, cancer potency. And I think there are some questions that will come up. You know, these are not, uh, but we're not, we're not really looking at lifetime. Uh, we're looking at fairly short periods uh, of time. So, and, and also the pathway or the route of intake is uh, certainly ingestion for many chemicals is much different uh, than inhalation. And I think dermal tends to be more like inhalation because it's going in um, to the bloodstream without going through the liver and being transformed rather quickly into, into byproduct chemicals. So you have this first path. So, I mean, that's the reason you want to probably sort of don't, don't aggregate all the routes together. So I don't think you can go from exposure dose to dose without saying this is a dermal exposure dose is the inhalation. But then the other question is, is it might be useful to uh, also talk about the intake, how many milligrams are taken in over a certain time period. Uh, because I think when we start getting into health effects, uh, 
you may want to have that information available. It, it's there, it's just that if it gets suppressed, if everything gets aggregated into some uh, rate and that rate is averaged out, you're swamping out where that's a rate over a season, maybe a soccer season, I don't know how long they go, but uh, or it's over a sh uh, much less than lifetime period. And uh, I think there are some methods uh, that will come up in risk assessment for sort of looking at it. So, it, so the recommendation, because I want to be concrete, is don't just sort everything and aggregate everything as an exposure dose without recognizing there is a time period associated with that exposure. And I'm not talking about the exposure time, the amount of time on the field, but the, ex the, um, the lifetime period or the, the annual period or some time factor which really isn't in here that might be relevant uh, to, to the health effect or, or could be if we have better data for some of these chemicals. So it's just a matter of storing, you know, when you pass it off, store not just the exposure dose, but the route by which it goes in, the route of intake, and some information about how long that individual was exposed at that rate. Dr. Engels. Thank you, Dr. Sandy Eckel from USC. Um, so I had a couple comments. I, I'm I kind of, again coming from a statistical viewpoint. So thinking about um, the issues of the, the online survey and some of these more outlying values, a couple of my comments and suggestions are: if there's only a, a handful of outlying values, I think you know it's pretty clearly some of those are, are an issue. We can probably more safely exclude those. But if there are larger numbers, you know, one idea is to potentially look across responses on the same survey. If you know, if someone responded that they they did 24 hours of activity, you know, if they also have sort of unusual responses uh, for the other questions, that might help you make decisions about whether to use their data or not. Um, and I also noticed that it seems like these unusual outliers were related to age, you know, the, the, the kind of teenage uh, respondents were kind of responding to these more unusual values. So it might be harder to ascertain values for that population than other populations. So that might be something to think about. Um, the teenagers and, don't sleep either. <laughs> Uh, and, and as Dr. Abel talked about, there was these interesting differences by sex. You know, part of me wonders if there was some some response bias, or maybe the this, the representativeness was different by by sex. And you know, you could potentially think about weighting uh, responses to try to get um, samples that are more representative of the population overall. Um, just some some possible ideas. Um, and then I, I also had a question. I can't quite recall. I remember seeing, um, you know, at a previous meeting, discussions about how the air was sampled at the fields. But I was just wondering if you could remind me, um, because this is an important input for the, the dose calculation for inhalation, um, was it sort of a, a time period average expo uh, uh, concentration of air? Or was it, uh, like, I, I just want to make sure that you're kind of accounting for, you know, heavy activity on the field and potential kind of plumes of, of uh, dust that might be coming up uh, during activity. So that, that was a question, I guess. So, uh, for in terms of sampling the air, we, we sample the air uh, an hour before any activity, and then we put, uh, it, actually there's four different air stations, and um, out the field, on the field, behind the gold box, and before one hour before activity, and then we have three hours of the activity to potentially collect a plume. And we always try to put it downwind from the go box, okay. and then another hour after all the activity. So uh, we try our best to collect the sample that potentially represent uh, the breathing. And we also collect the air sample at different heights. I'm looking at Dr. Madalena because she's our field person as well. Uh, so we try to cover the horizontal, the temple and then the vertical distribution of the air as well. So, so that raises a question for me. Do you account for um, you know, smaller children you know, being lower to the ground and not in these, in these air concentration? Yeah, yeah, that's why we collect the multiple levels. So we collect the different briefing zone okay. uh, for different age. Okay, and then, then the concentration in the air that's input into these equations will be sort of a, a three or four hour period average. Is that what's used then or? Uh, every half an hour half an hour per, one hour, one hour per sample. Okay. So are we gonna talk about it later today on the air sample? Yeah, we, we have another section about uh, sampling the air and analysis of the VOC, volatile organic chemicals, later today. Okay, thank you. Dr. Bennett. 
Um, I was just thinking, uh, based on what uh, Dr. Aval was saying, I mean, when I looked at the medians in the 95th percentiles, I was kind of looking at them like, okay, those medians look like a rec player. And then I was looking, okay, the 95th percentiles look like my friend's kids because my friend's kids all pick, play competitive. And it made me really realize that, you know, it, it's almost like you couldn't really do a probabilistic analysis with this, you would have to use straight up 95th percentile values because you're really looking at two populations. And so those same ones that are spending more time on the field are also probably those ones that said they were had a greater proportion of their time in high activity because they're obviously the ones that are pushing more. And so in a way, I kind of feel like you've got two populations in the same distribution. And I don't know if you have information as to whether they were recreational players or competitive players. We do. We have information on whether they were recreational or competitive. And we these are all, so we have all positions here as well, too. Because it might make sense to analyze the competitive players separately, because they are going to have consistently higher values. And I bet that's probably explaining the difference between the males and the females is just the, simply the percent that were competitive versus rec. Not really that they're different. Go ahead, Ed. So I just have a process question. Are, is this the time frame in which we should be addressing the, these other sections that support these tables, or, or are we going to step through the different sections of this report throughout the day? We're going to. We, we're going to talk about ingestion next and then dermal, the dermal path. But we're not going to step through the, for example, section four or section, you know, I mean, step through the sections of it. This is section four. This is essentially the section we've four. We've just done the first part, the first yeah, pathway. First part, yeah, we're going to have this little discussion. Right okay, now. so if I have questions about inhalation from section four, I should ask them now? If you're, yes, but about inhalation, probably now. Okay. <laughs> so I'm sorry. So may I ask one more question? Of course, Ed. Okay, thank you. So I have a question for you on table 417, uh, which gets at sensitivity factors for ages. And it refers to, that's on page 4-27 of the document. Um, so the age groups, I assume, are, are supported by previous published work, it looks like, that you've done. But I was because the age sensitivity factors sort of drop off from 16 on up, I mean, the mid-teen years are an interesting year in terms of of lung development, because you're sort of capturing girls' maturation in lungs development in the late teens, but you haven't quite caught up with the boys who are still growing. And so in terms of sensitivity factors, I was curious as to, you know, because you sort of downscaled how important the boys are because you chopped it at 16 as opposed to going to some more conventional like, you know, into the early 20s or to 21 or something like that. As a board certified pulmonologist, I can uh, uh, support what uh, Ed says, you know, like everything else, uh, girls mature faster than boys uh, in terms of lung function. Uh, so it actually does continue, actually it continues in girls past 16 too, uh, but especially Boys. But I guess my question is sort of yeah. the 16 sort of chops it right in the middle of when I, I, I would still agree developing. that I'd be more comfortable with, uh, you know, uh, actually early 20s cut off. Um, maybe I can interject here. Um, so uh, these age sensitivity factors are applied to the cancer estimate. So they're not applied to non cancer outcomes. And there to address uh, the increased sensitivity to cancer, and they were reviewed by the scientific review panel for the Air Resources Board in OEHA. Um, but we can look at those issues further. We will look at those issues further. But I just wanted to emphasize that actually it's for the cancer endpoint, and um, in deriving the reference levels for the non-cancer endpoints, enhanced susceptibility at different life stages is also considered, but there isn't a separate factor like this for it. It's in the assumption of the variability factors that you assume in that reference exposure level calculation. Does that help? Thank you, Lauren. Any other questions? Oh, Dr. Kyle. 
Um, I, I have a couple comments that I hope fit at this time, and if not, please cut me off. But um, one is about this issue of how to appropriately portray the um, the susceptibility or sensitivity at younger ages. You know, I, I didn't particularly come to that in this table, but overall that cutting that at 16 and applying it only in some cases, I understand it comes from some guidelines that were reviewed at a certain time and in a certain context, but in this time and context, that seems insufficient to me. So I, I don't know that this is the time to get into that in detail, but I, since we're talking about it, I'm gonna say, uh, say I have that concern also more broadly. I bumped into it at a different table on a different page, but I think it's the same issue. Um, the second thing I wanted to say is, um, related also, I think, to some of these comments, and that is in thinking about this as a um, public science document and a public science process, I think that the issues about how it's um, too much aggregated really need to be addressed, because I, I think that, there, that a lot of this stuff, people could understand if it was broken out in pieces, but nobody can, nobody understands rates address th values adjusted by body weights and rates you know it's just it's an, it's ununderstandable to someone who, without uh, quantitative training generally and so um, and I also think that it would be good if people could plug in their own numbers in terms of how much time they spend spend on the field you know that we not embed that so deeply in here that it's based on your study it would be better if, if if I'm a soccer player, which I was for many years, I would want to look at, take my numbers and plug them in and say, so what would this mean for me? And then we don't have to work, did someone say this already? Yeah, okay, she's nodding like, I've already heard this, Amy, hurry up. Um, so, uh, and then you don't have to worry as much about whether your time activity study is correct, right? Because people can can do the, figure it out, look at it from what they do. So, um, and maybe you need to plug in your weight too, you know, but maybe there's some other things like that. But I do think this is gonna be, the way it's presented is, is too aggregated in terms of um, the ways that have been mentioned, but also conceptually. And there's no, there's no reason not to break it out into one step at a time and make a friendly picture of it so that people can understand it. And then after that, you can combine it all up into rates if you must. Um, I had one other thing that I was gonna bring up. Um, oh, yeah. And that is, did you, and maybe I missed this, I didn't see it, but I have to admit I haven't read every single one of these pages uh, fully. Did any of the take home exposure issues end up in here or was that excluded? Either through uh, stuff that ends up accumulating in cars or in um, you know, and, uh, washers or at home. I didn't see it in here, so I'm just wondering. So uh, multiple questions, one, one question at a time. Uh, for in terms of like uh, parking your own weight, parking your, your time, uh, how would I be in terms of the overall exposure? We have a lot of discussion within the WEA how we should present the risk and the exposure at the end for the report so the public can understand and also for the individual who are interested in how am I in terms of relative to the other if I play two years versus my whole life. We're aware of soccer can be a whole life sit, uh, scenario. So we are in active discussion on how we should present the risk, and we definitely want to bring the panel back in the next time to fully invest in how we should present the risk and how we should do the risk assessment in the terms of the scientific world we understand, and also the public can have a better understand and how we communicate to the individual. So we are looking at different ways of presenting it and how we can be interactive. Now is the stage of people all go on the internet and want to do, can do things on their personal. So we are thinking about the approach uh, to address your suggestion. We take it very seriously. And the second about the take home exposure. In our survey, we do have question about how much you have seen in your car, where did you see it in your bathroom, uh, how much you estimate, uh, how, how long do you, before you go to your shower. So we have those questions. Uh, we did not put it in this presentation. Uh, 
is something we are considering thinking how we can address this pathway. It's, uh, it's a much more complex pathway than just playing on the field. So uh, we'll look into it and see what we can do. We do have the survey data for it. So thank you, Patty. Um, so we're scheduled for a, a short break now. Is that something we still want to do? Does the court reporter need a break? No. Well, uh, if we don't need a break, then um, Jocelyn, maybe you want to move forward. So now we're going to do the ingestion pathway. Okay, so now we'll move on to the ingestion pathway. So the non-cancer exposure dose and cancer exposure dose equations are shown here in the table. Uh, you can see these equations once again follow the general format we discussed. There are concentrations, intake rates, and exposure times. So the bioaccessible concentration of a chemical from the crumb rubber is a value that's measured in artificial biofluids to mimic stomach conditions um, from the samples collected in the field study. This concentration represents the amount of a chemical that is available to be absorbed into the body. The gastrointestinal relative absorption factor is a fraction that represents the amount of a chemical that is absorbed by the GI tract compared to the amount that's available for absorption. Unless chemical-specific data are available, a WEHA will assume this value is equal to one and that 100% of the bioaccessible chemical will be absorbed by the GI tract. The ingestion rate um, is derived from literature and information from the exposure study. Um, this parameter represents the amount of crumb rubber that is ingested per day, normalized to body weight. It is the sum of the ingestion rates for the direct and indirect pathways. Uh, we'll talk about the direct ingestion rate first, which represents crumb rubber that is incidentally or intentionally ingested. Um, these values are derived from literature and anecdotal evidence. So it's equal to the ingestion amount uh, derived from various recent crumb rubber studies in the literature and anecdotal evidence from soccer players divided by the body weight. And so ingestion amounts vary from 0 0.01 to 10.4 grams of crumb rubber. The last two columns, 3.55 and 10.4 grams, represent the weight of one teaspoon and one tablespoon of crumb rubber, respectively, which players um, have reported to be amounts that they may possibly ingest. The check marks here indicate which values will be considered for which field user category. And a WEHA body weight values, as presented in guidelines, are adopted for the body weight parameter unless athletes provided one in the survey. So next is the ingestion rate for hand-to-mouth activity. So this represents crumb rubber particles that are ingested after the hand comes in contact with the field and then touches the mouth. These values are derived from the literature and, data and video data from the exposure study. So here shows the equation to calculate the hand-to-mouth ingestion rate. Uh, this parameter is a function of the adherence of crumb rubber to the hand and then the amount of particles that are able to be transferred from the hand. So the adherence factor describes the amount of crumb rubber that will adhere to the skin per unit of surface area for the hand. These values are adopted from a literature study that measured particle loading onto various body parts of soccer players who played on a field with crumb rubber infill. The part of the hand that is assumed to be in direct contact with the mouth is assumed to be four fingers. This represents about four, this represents about 10% of the total surface area of both hands. Data on the surface area was taken from ex the EPA exposure factor handbook to derive this parameter. The hand to mouth transfer factor describes the fraction of crumb rubber that will be transferred from the hand into the mouth. For this study, OEHA will adopt a value of 0.5 as seen in OEHA guidelines. 
This means that 50% of the crumb rubber on the hand would be assumed to be transferred into the mouth. The number of hand-to-mouth contacts um, is, was derived from the time activity study, the video data. So shown here is the adherence factor of the hand as taken from that literature study I mentioned, Kissel et al. Here shows the calculated surface area of the four fingers that are assumed to be in direct contact with the mouth. These values were calculated by multiplying the surface area of both hands by 10%. And here shows the hand-to-mouth contacts per hour for each field user category. For athletes and young bystanders, the values were derived from video data of soccer players and archived video footage of young children playing outdoors on natural turf. It is anticipated that playful behaviors on natural turf would be similar to those on synthetic turf, so these values would reasonably represent the exposure that children may have. Data on the number of hand-to-mouth activity, hand-to-mouth contacts for adults is very, li very limited since this type of behavior is considered more important for children. These parameter values were adopted from a recent observational study of adults that determined the hand-to-mouth contact frequency of workers um, performing desk work or paperwork throughout a one-hour period of the day. While engaged in desk work, the assumption is that one's hands would be engaged and thus unavailable for hand-to-mouth contact. Um, conversely, um, while in between such tasks, which was also measured in the study, one's hands are anticipated to be free and available for contact, similar to a bystander, coach, or referee scenario. So values for this parameter were adopted from this study for bystanders, coaches, and referees. Next, the object-to-mouth ingestion rate. This rate represents crumb rub this represents crumb rubber particles that may be ingested after an object has been in direct contact with the field and then touches the mouth. Uh, video data and literature data were used to derive this parameter. So here's the equation to calculate the object to mouth uh, ingestion rate. It's a function of adherence of crumb to the object and then the amount of particles that may be transferred from the object into the mouth. So the adherence factor for the object describes the amount of crumb rubber that will adhere to the object after contacting the field. We had did not measure any adherence factor for objects in our field study, but toys and pacifiers are anticipated to be the most likely types of objects in such an activity, since video data did not show players engaging of many activities of this type. Toys and pacifiers can often be made of materials such as plastics and silicone, um, which may act in a manner similar to the skin. So we propose to use the adherence factor for the hand as a surrogate in this case. The part of the object that contacts the mouth is assumed to be limited by the area of the mouth. Uh, the mouth area is assumed to be one ninth of the surface area of the head and data of, for the surface area of the head was taken from the exposure factor handbook. The object to mouth transfer factor describes the amount of crumb rubber that's transferred from the object into the mouth. For this study, uh, we have will assume 100% of crumb rubber on an object will be transferred into the mouth. So for young child bystanders, archived video footage is used to estimate uh, the object to mouth contacts that may occur on the sidelines. It's anticipated once again that these behaviors um, would be similar to those that would occur on synthetic turf fields and would be, a, would be reasonable to, to represent their exposure on turf fields. So this table shows the calculated surface area um, of the object that would reach the mouth. These values are derived by multiplying the surface area of the head taken from exposure factors handbook, multiplied by one ninth. And then this table shows the object to mouth contacts per hour for child bystanders. No differences were found due to age or gender for the data, and athletes, coaches, and referees, and adult bystanders are expected to have negligible exposure through this pathway, which is why they're not included here in the table. So lastly, the hand-to-object-to-mouth ingestion rate represents crumb rubber particles that may be ingested after the hand touches the field, then an object which will ultimately go into the mouth. These parameter values are derived from literature and video data. 
So this is the equation for the hand to object mouth ingestion rate. It's a function of adherence of crumb rubber to the hand and then the amount that may be transferred from the hand to the object. The part of the hand in direct contact with an object may vary based on the type of contact. Uh, video data show that objects involved in this type of activity are dietary objects such as water bottles or food. We hope we use the assumption that one hand will be used when eating or drinking on the field. Young children are also assumed to touch objects such as toys or pacifiers after their hands have contacted the field. So one hand will also be assumed for this kind of activity. The fraction of the amount of crumb rubber lost from the hand prior to transfer on an object describes the amount that is lost from the hand after activities such as hand washing or wiping hands on clothing before handling an object. Following OEHA guidelines, a value of 0.25 is adopted for this parameter. OEHA will also consider using a value equal to zero since opportunities for hand washing may not be readily available at the field. Additionally, athletes or bystanders may wipe their hands on clothing or towels that have been in contact with the field surface and may be saturated with crumb rubber. The number of hand-to-object-to-mouth contacts per hour for athletes and young bystanders is derived from the video data. So shown here is the calculated area of the hand in contact with an object. One hand is assumed, which is equal to 25% of the total surface area of both hands. So these values were derived by multiplying the total surface area by 25%. This table shows the derived hand-to-mouth contacts per hour for athletes and child bystanders from the video data and archived video data. Coaches, referees, and adult bystanders are expected to have negligible exposure through this pathway. So all of those ingestion rates that we just <coughs> talked about, they're all summed together, and then that value is plugged back into our main equation here. Then moving on, the exposure duration represents the years of exposure. Values are shown here for the age groups. The averaging time, as mentioned earlier, is the time over which the exposure duration is averaged. This value is equal to 70 years by default. And then the exposure time and exposure frequency, we talked about these earlier. They represent the hours per day and days per week that um, field users spend on the field. Um, the data presented before were in different age groups, so now we have the data of with the four OEHA age groups, as you can see here. So this table shows the data of the exposure times based on these age groups, um, differences between gender and age, and again, the data are separated based on season and for practices versus games. So the central tendency is about one to two hours a day for practices or games while higher estimates range from two to six hours. For coaches, referees, and bystanders, the values are the same as those presented in the inhalation pathway. So here is the exposure frequency, um, differences between gender and age, data separated by season and for practice versus game. Players tend to spend one to two hours per week each for practices and games, while higher estimates range from two to six. And again, the exposure frequencies for coaches, referees, and adult bystanders will be the same as those previously presented in the inhalation pathway. So thanks, Jocelyn. Um, so now the ingestion pathway discussion is open for comments. Dr. Kyle. Thank you for um, going through that. That's help, very helpful, actually, to go through these. Um, so this might be my same point made a different way, but why do you? Why I don't see why you embed the body weight throughout this. It just makes it harder to understand. You know, what's a rate per body weight? I mean, when people think about their ingestion, it's not dependent on their body weight. Um, uh, 
Yes, we, we do have the ingestion amount in the equation. And uh, the whole equation at the end is the dose per body weight. I know, but why don't you put it in at the end? That's sort of my question, because I think as you put it in here throughout and describe it as a rate, it's just mind-bogglingly unintuitive, because you don't usually have a, an, the ingestion is not related to your body weight, right? Yeah. No. So uh, um, it sort of goes back to, if you put things together that make it impossible to understand, then it doesn't serve the kind of the public purpose. So I, I just can't even think of a reason to put the body weight in at the beginning. So that's my question, I guess. I think this might have been based on a recommendation of Dr. McCone's in the past, but. Uh -oh. From about, uh, maybe from about 20 years ago, too, and it well, no, holds so today. Well, maybe for a different so audience. No, this, I mean, is, this is a really good point, and it's, it gets to, so you, you know, risk assessment is entirely based on rate per body weight. I think you raise a good point about what's public facing is, is should it be something that people can understand. Maybe I'll, I'll give you a story. I was involved in a, a risk assessment at the National Academy for communities that had been exposed for a short time, like a couple of weeks, to fairly high levels of zinc cadmium sulfide. We don't know anything about it. We tried to do a risk assessment for cadmium. We found out the communities didn't really understand what we were doing, right? I mean, we did a nice risk assessment. We did cumulative, or we did cumulative intake over the period, did the lifetime equivalent, calculated the risk, and you know, it doesn't, I have to say, it doesn't make sense when you come up with a number like 100,000. Uh, so what we ended up doing was for the public document, we calculated their cumulative intake over the event, compared it to their cumulative intake of cadmium, which is everywhere in the environment. It's in your food, it's in, and, and explain that. And then that, they, they didn't know how we did risk, but they said, oh, well, in, we took in only like one hundredth of what we would take in in a year, and much less in a lifetime, and, and we took it. So you can show them that their intake went up for one month, that, that month they were high, but on an annual basis. And then we said, your risk is entirely based on your cumulative intake over the year, because this is not a, a chronic effect, I mean, it's not an acute effect, it's chronic. I mean, they kind of understood that. And so I think this, it gets to this point about what's public facing versus what's needed for a risk assessment. And I think we have to document, I mean, or we have to document this. But it might be useful to, to, and I think it's what I was trying to get at earlier, is carry along the cumulative, you know, just tell people, all right, we did all these calculations, and this is how many milligrams of whatever you took in, phthalates, and, uh, and if you weigh more, then this is more important, and, and maybe just give them a tool so they can figure out all the variations, otherwise, Nobody's going to go through all this. So if you give them their cumulative intake, then they can understand different routes, even though we have to say, you know, ingestion doesn't equal inhalation. But they can they can look at a kind of a number that we say this is. And then they can say things like, oh, phthalates. Okay, what's that number? I don't know if we should do this, but somebody else could say, well, if you're an average person and use this shampoo or use this makeup, right, this is your annual intake of phthalates, right? So you can go, oh, you know, my two hours a day on the field is this, my use of brand X of shampoo is this, you know, right? you, know you know, you can start getting a sense. And, and to me, it gets to what the public understands in terms of risk, and I, my experience is they have a really hard time when you say one, one in 100,000, uh, but they understand more when you say, okay, this is something you're exposed to, and this is what you get from this activity, and this is what you get from that activity. And even though from a risk perspective, the cumulative intake over a year or two years may not be what we can use, we do use it in some way. We just average it out. Yeah. So anyway, I don't know if that's useful, but I, th I think I mean, it I is think a, it's a, it's yeah. a point we're getting to that this is, I mean, from my, I look through all these tables and go, yeah, that's the way I do it, and you know, we need all these things, but I'm, I am concerned that this is really hard to track, and what mm -hmm. people want to know is, what am I getting, and how bad is it, and, and did you account for what I do? Like, did you account for my time? Uh, I stick my hand in my mouth all the time, I don't take a shower, you know, make sure that is conveyed as, in, in, in a clear way. Yeah, and I think we're getting a number of really helpful suggestions in terms of communicating and how we need to break 
this down more in communicating with the public when we're talking about risk. I just, just want to speak a little bit to the science side of the body weight issue. So, you know, we're looking at soccer players that are, I think we even have a survey from one that's between two and six. We have teenagers, we have adults, and they're of different ages. And so some of the intakes, even some of the ingestion rates by small people, <laughs> uh, children, um, the dose really is dose per body weight. That's how we calculate it. So we're taking this little person and putting maybe even a greater dose. They're getting a greater uh, intake. So we want to normalize the intake in order to calculate dose. And then in terms of breathing rates also, there's greater breathing rate per body weight. So it's a, in the younger, the, the, the smaller you are oftentimes. So it's our, also our way of adjusting for age differences. But, so but you're adjusting, I mean, you're incorporating age as the way to um, look at those different rates, not weight. With, so well, so I, maybe I, if we laid this out a little bit more, you'd see why that was there. So that age adjustment factor is for cancer. That's independent of the body weight issue. And no, deriving I, that factor, yeah, you know, a, uh, amount per body weight was addressed. And yet we still saw, even after addressing exposure differences of, uh, you know, young animals versus or young versus older, we did still see increased susceptibility to cancer. So, so there is this body weight issue we need to probably explain better. But, yeah, um, no, I, I'm not disputing that. I understand why you have to adjust for body weight. All I'm saying is when you're discussing the ingestion rate, to, to present that by body weight is very uh, counterintuitive, and it's not actually a rate based on body weight. It's a rate based on time or something like that. So. Okay, so I have a second point. This is simpler. And that is, I, I would really recommend we not use Greek letters in here. You know, because a lot of people look at that Greek letter, they don't know what that is or even how to say it. And so why put in that barrier to uh, anybody being able to even read this equation? So um, that's a minor thing, but um, I would recommend that. <laughs> Any other questions or comments from the panel? Dr. Bennett. Um, both Linda and I are over here discussing our concern uh, and questions regarding the table on slide 22, the ingestion, direct ingestion rates. We have questions on this one too. Okay, because I we've got the exposure factors handbook pulled up, and for example, the for you know kids two to one to two, sort of the central or two to six, the central tendency is sixty milligrams, um, which would be just over that 0 0.05 grams per day. So the 0 0.01 seems really low, and we're wondering where that came from, right? Because that would be 10 milligrams, which is a sixth of the um, amount in the exposure factor handbook. Yeah, so these are the values that came from the two studies, the RIVM and the ECA. They're previously published recently, 20, both of them 2017, yeah. Um, these are the values that they've used in their assessments. Um, the child bison, they're typically used for athletes, the coaches, referees, the child bison, is that? I don't know if that's supposed to, the check may not, that may be for the adult bystanders, it may be an incorrect place, because the lower ones are for the, more for the adults than the children. The ten okay, and for example, the soil pica estimate in the exposure factors handbook is uh, 1,000 milligrams, which is, oh wait a second, never mind. I was doing that wrong. I was thinking that was the same as the 10 grams, but I guess that's actually um, fine. So that would be one gram. And for the child bystander, you do have a value that exceeds that with the three grams. Okay. Just 
Can I make a comment on that? Yeah. So these are, these are not, a t I mean, so the Exposure Factors Handbook intends to capture the daily intake of soil, right, for a child. And I think this is intended to capture just the amount of intake during an event. Now yeah, again, no, I, might, I, given what's in the Exposure Factors Handbook, you could question uh, whether it's reasonable that it would not be as high as the daily rate, but if it's if there's documentation, but I, you know if the intent is this is not total soil ingestion on a daily basis, this is the added ingestion or the amount of that ingestion that would take place at an athletic event or a site. Well, then that gets to the other question on 37. I'm a little bit confused by the equations on slides 36 and 37. Are they the same? Okay, so first, well, okay, let's look at the cancer one. So this has got the exposure time so are you then multiplying, it, it doesn't seem to be divided or normalized to anything, and the ingestion is per day, and the exposure time is expressed in terms of hours per day? So how does that work? Are you then somehow dividing by 24 hours to get the fraction of the day? I mean, that makes sense for the mouthing if you're doing rates by hour, but the ingestion rates are per day so in that, that table we were looking factor. at. Huh? Yeah, that conversion factor there I have, it just says conversion factor. So some that conversion factor is the hour, it's the conversion to get that into to match. Yeah, but then into. why if, but then what you're effectively doing is that you're saying that these child, you know, all of these in direct ingestion rates, you're then effectively dividing those by 10 because if you're taking the exposure time and dividing by 24 hours, and those are per day, so for the, the direct ingestion pathway, you wouldn't want to normalize by the exposure time, right? Because these aren't hourly. These are given in their table as grams per day. So it doesn't make sense to then normalize them by the exposure time. That totally makes sense when you've got contacts per hour and da 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 da. You want to deal with how long you're there. But if you're starting with a gram per day measure, you don't want to then reduce that by the exposure time over the 24 hours. So that doesn't make sense. It does. It does? Yes, it does. That's why we, we are showing the panel, uh, because the ingestion, like the, the soccer player they report is per event, how much they eat uh, during event, like a tablespoon. I agree. Right, right, you're saying these RIVM ones, that was based on something where it was per, uh, per event at the field, right? Sorry? The so like this 0 .01 grams per day, that's if the child spent the 24 hours on the soccer field, or is that per time that the child is at practice? That's the assumption then made by our IVM per day. Right. Yes. So if that's an assumption per day, why are you then multiplying it by exposure time over 24 hours? Yeah, that's why I say we agree with your... Oh, 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 you agree. Okay, we agree. I'm sorry, yes, you were telling we agree. me that I thought you, I, I misunderstood. Like I thought you were situation. defending it. I was like, no! Yes, we agree. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm glad and we have a meeting have of the minds another here. another question yes. on the non-cancer exposure dose. I always thought for the non-cancer, you didn't multiply by the exposure duration over the averaging time because you're worried about the exposure over the course of a year to get a non-cancer health effect. I thought. It is a chronic exposure, but the dose is represented as the daily dose. Right, so why are you multiplying it by the exposure duration over the averaging time? Because if the child is 10, and you're then dividing, you know, they've been exposed for 10 years, and you're dividing that by 70 years, you're basically saying on average they're getting a seventh of that, and for non-cancer chronic health effects, I 
always thought the convention was you were worried about their typical exposure and didn't then, s during the time that they were exposed, because that's, you know, these non-cancers, how much can your body take and process without having the non-cancer because it's compared against, uh, um, you know, a particular value. It's not a, a, and so if you're being exposed to that amount every day over the life that you've had so far, it doesn't make sense to multiply it by the exposure duration over the averaging time because you're exposed to a lot more than that per day during the life you've had. Yeah, uh, the, ex the averaging time here is, is not the 70 year normally used for cancer. Uh, it depends on life stage. It's to just that if you have, uh, for example, the, the third trimester, you have an ED of uh, quarter a year, the exposure, the averaging time is actually average for that period of time. So where you have your age group and you have exposure duration year, that's also the same thing as your averaging time? Your exposure duration equals your averaging time for all periods? In general, yes, for non-cancer. Uh, the USCP put it in, uh, we adopt the equation, a general equation here. Uh, in residential scenario, they account for people who live there and they take vacation. So that's why the averaging time is not as exactly the exposure time. They consider 365 days for the averaging time, but 350 days for the exposure duration because people take vacation. But in this scenario, it's different because uh, we assume that people on the field, whenever on the field, what's the daily exposure? So they will correspond to the same age or the life stage. Well, it's just really confusing to have yeah. it the way it's presented since then on the next slide you say yeah. default value 70 years for the average in time. Yeah, I, I think that we, yeah. um, you know, when we it just uh, looks like it needs write it up, up in the report, okay. I think we need to, and we've received a number of comments about how hard it is to follow, so I think I, what I'm hearing is a recommendation that we really carefully step people through the calculation and um, make sure that uh, if we're switching averaging times in the middle of an explanation, that can be pretty confusing. So we'll take a look at that, thanks. But can, can I, this is where I go back to the point where, you know, there's what you need to do a risk assessment. And, and I agree, you have to follow the, if you start playing around with the terminology and the protocols of a risk assessment, you, you'll get the wrath of the entire risk assessment community. But this, this idea that um, maybe to help make sense of this, have another column so you can report the dose here, which is a, actually kind of dose rate. But then something that people could grasp, like the cumulative intake in a season or a year. And again, this is not what you're basing. It is what you're basing the risk assessment on, but it's a number that people could grasp. And I would probably put an either milligrams per kilogram, which again, people are gonna have a hard time with that, but that's really the relevant number because of the age sensitivity and age differential, but maybe put both numbers and then say, well, they're so different because body weights change so much. Um, but I mean, somewhere there's gonna be a table with these non-cancer exposure dose and the cancer exposure dose. And I don't know how hard it is to have one more calm just to say, for clarity or to help you understand, this would be the typical intake in, and I don't know if the right number is a season or a year, or something something that would be relevant to a soccer player. It's like, oh, this is what I would get in a year. There's how many milligrams. Um, and it, it, it's not gonna be useful to do a risk assessment unless you know how to translate that backwards, mm -hmm. but it would, and it's actually a neat way, I think, to even for us, I mean, when I look at all these different rates and for body weight, um, it's hard to audit. It's much easier to audit an, integrate, an integral quantity than it is a, a rate, or make sense of a rate. I mean, rates are hard to get, I mean, for most people, not for engineers, but yeah. yeah. And, and it might address some of the concerns that, that we have here without, Again, I would, I would never suggest uh, altering the way you present the risk calculation because it opens you up to really significant attacks about like reinventing risk assessment. Mm 
Linda, did you want to say something? Yeah. Um, first of all, to address what Tom said, um, you know, I think it's the way all of us think of different things. Being an exposure person, I look at the amount that goes in during a period like you do. I would, I would first give that and then say, you know, this is what you get over a season, but now let's translate this into what is a health risk where we have to go exposure to dose. So it sort of gives what people are talking about in terms of what you're exposed to or what you bring into your body, but now we're taking the, the step further. Um, now, my, my other comments, and they're a little, um, at a little higher level, um, Let's go back to page 27, the one that shows the, the checks and what the, the risk amounts are. Um, you did get though that data from two different references. And I guess my question is, is how did they develop that data? Um, you know, the 0 0.01 grams per day, the 0 0.05. Again, was it taking other data? The, I always have a lot of trouble with um, ingestion, the indirect, the hand to mouth, all of this, because there are so many assumptions that go into it. And, and there's, you know, you just don't know what to do with it. Um, in my former life, before I was retired, um, I was, you know, the science director of one of our labs. Our labs did a lot of modeling. They did big air models. They did. PBPK models, they did exposure models. And what I was always told is not only do you develop the model, but how do you evaluate that model to give some confidence in what those levels are. Um, this is an extremely difficult thing to evaluate, but I think some thought needs to be given to how do you evaluate it. Um, and also, you know, so just when you take all of your assumptions and look and say, what is the ingestion that's brought, that, that you get the, the crumb rubber in, how many, you know, milligrams a day are you estimating for each of these groups? You know, does it agree? Does it not agree? And then I would also say, Given the different exposure pathways, what is the relative magnitude of each of these pathways? So if this is one one hundredth of, of inhalation, then maybe it's not so bad that you have all these assumptions. If it's a hundred times what the, inje what the inhalation rate is, then you know, you need to make sure that you have it right. And so I just, I, you know, it's, it is the perpetual issue with exposure modeling. It's not new to you, but is there anything that you can do for this study to give yourself more confidence in what you've done? Um, and then the other thing is just sort of really trivial. Someplace reading through it, they talked about um, mouthpieces. And I remember when my kids were playing soccer, they dangle these mouthpieces in, out, every place, wipe it on their arm, wipe it on the ground, put it back in their mouth. Some people, I mean, this was the way to look cool, right? And um, there's nothing in here um, that looks at these these mouthpieces, and I don't know if it's important or not. But you did. There was a sentence of, uh, on it. Then I said, "Oh yeah, mouthpieces," and then that was the last I heard of mouthpieces. So you know, just think about those again, or take that sentence out so nobody else thinks about it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Kyle. I think this goes back to uh, just three or four points ago, but I'm still um, hung up a little bit on this um, averaging time of 54 years. Is that right? Or exposure time of 54 years and averaging time of 70 years. Is that what we're applying for non-cancer effects? I'm just, I, I'm asking because I don't really understand. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem quite clear in here, anywhere that I can see. Um, maybe I won't put you on the spot to answer that, but um, I mean, are, are there concerns we would have for a 16-year-old girl 
based on a 54-year exposure and 70-year averaging time? I, I, it doesn't seem to make sense, so. Um, try to answer it. Uh, based on the, the non-cancer, uh, we I think we, we do have an error typo here. The averaging time is the average for the period you exposure. So if you have a 54 year, which is 16 to 70 years old, your exposure duration is 54 years, and you're averaging for the 54 years of the exposure. And then we, we can actually look at for the whole 70 years for the exposure, and for different life stage by segment. Well, that doesn't make sense to me because the health effects you would have, you would be most concerned about for non-cancer effects for a 16-year-old girl would be shorter than that, shorter duration. You mean, sorry, I... Well, suppose you were worried about reproductive effects. Uh, okay, so like I said, uh, we are looking at the daily exposure dose, so uh, we'll be, what we are doing with uh, according to the guideline is you have an age group of 16 to 70. So we look at the activity and we look at the body weight and we take a daily dose for the 54 years and then we average it out for the 54 years of the exposure. And I think this comes back to my question before, is this really an appropriate method to use for young girls? We are listening, so yeah. we are looking for input on how we should address it for, this is a very special study, not like normal residential exposure. So uh, we, we would love to have your input on how should we handle this, this kind of estimation that's a traditional way, and how can we more appropriate present the risk to the public to the point that it's look reasonable and also scientifically reasonable. So we are listening and we, we hope that to, to get input from you, everybody. Yeah, can I offer some? So, um, I mean, there are the protocols for risk assessment, which are uh, constrained by the fact that we really, for, for risk assessment, we use lifetime cancer risk because we don't know how to do less than lifetime. But we know how to make some adjustments for more sensitive age groups. So I think where the confusion is, is how you make that adjustment, whether you adjust it by altering the averaging time to much less than lifetime or the exposure duration. I mean, either way, so you have this factor at the end of the equation, which for cancer, for non-cancer, they're just comparing the exposure rate to an acceptable rate. The rel is a, is, is a rate of exposure milligram per kilogram day that is, below any, you know, has a sufficient margin of safety with respect to harmful effects. So on, on the non-cancer side, it's comparing a rate to a rate, right? A, ra a rate that's okay versus the rate they get. And hopefully the rate they get isn't way up over what's the reference exposure limit. On the cancer side, it gets difficult because we're trying to look at a slope factor that's based on lifetime equivalent dose. And the so the ED over AT, the exposure duration over averaging time is sort of this mechanism for adjusting that. And so you could either use some defaults for those uh, and then say, I'm, we're getting into the risk assessment, but it's where you make the adjustment to account for higher sensitivity. And, and I think that's where the question is, is, and how to make that very clear that that's what's being done. And um, again, I think a little bit of this is, is uh, a consequence of the way risk assessment protocols were developed. You have to, that's the standard equation, you know, it's your exposure turned into a lifetime equivalent. But I think uh, for a couple of reasons, one is just perception. Uh, it's difficult to tell people that, oh, you were exposed to these chemicals and we're gonna average it out over your lifetime because, you know, uh, but but if they get cancer, they're probably not gonna, they may get it in 10 years, right? I mean, there's these, these per perception issues about, well, I don't want you to average it out over the next 50 years or whatever's left of my life. I want you to tell me what the risk is now. 
And again, the, the sensitivity is the key to get at that, is to say, yeah, you know, normally in cancer, we average everything out to a lifetime. We have to because of cancer potency factor. I'm, I'm thinking, and again, this is getting technical. I mean, one way to get around this is to, uh, I don't know if you can follow the protocol of going to a margin of exposure with a benchmark, in which case you get rid of the, the you might be able to get rid of the, um, you, you could report the rate versus a rate that is a mm. point of departure for cancer risk assessment. It's, it might be a little more straightforward as a way to communicate this. I'm sorry I'm getting into things that are kind of technical within the risk assessment, but going away from a can well, I mean, you could still use a cancer potency because it really comes out of a benchmark, but I mean, California has a protocol for using a point of departure in a cancer dose response function and that, I mean, again, then the two would look more similar. It would be comparing a dose rate to a dose rate that we know over a lifetime leads to cancer, and then you can make some adjustments for that. We're getting into things that really are risk assessment related, but they do feed back into the exposure program. <laughs> Yeah, I think we're going to have to be um, much more careful in terms of how we march through and show the calculation. We could potentially look at the issue of margin of exposure and you know, see how that helps. I'm also hearing, though, that there is this issue of this shorter duration exposure and concern about reproductive effects. And I think that you know, we're talking about 16-year-olds, teenagers, and so forth. And I, I do think that, you know, we do have approaches that can look at these um, less averaged exposures. In fact, under some of our programs, we look even for at a single day, depending on what the chemical is. So I do think we have some more work to do looking at those shorter, uh, shorter duration issues in terms of peak exposure over short periods of time. So we'll follow up on that. And I'm sure have more discussions about how do we better express what we're finding. Okay. Any other questions or comments before we move on to dermal uh, exposure? So oh. I just want to clarify. So the, the, there is a realization that including the exposure duration over the averaging time for the non-cancer, that's just not part of the norm. Even though you guys were going to reduce the times, that's just not part of the standard convention for risk assessment for non-cancer is what Tom was saying as well, because you compare it to the reference dose. So that'll be removed, right? Even I mean, I think it's just confusing to have it in there, even if you adjust the time, because it's not... As far as I'm aware, it's not standard to put the exposure duration and averaging time in the non-cancer. That's a thing only for the there's, cancer. But there's no rel for chrome rubber, right? Well, we do have chronic reference exposure levels that are over longer duration that are sort of averaged concentrations and average doses. Right. But I think we need to lay this out better and probably, and I think potentially giving some case examples of how it plays out for the different kind of exposure reference levels. So we do have short-term reference levels, we have acute, we have chronic. And so I think we're, we might be, um, there might be some, it, it might not be laid out as clearly as it could be in this document. And I, I, what I'm hearing is we need to, we need to sort of step through and lay these out before giving entire equations on how the calculation works so that people can follow how, uh, for any particular kind of time duration reference dose, we're making the calculation. Is that, does that help? I'm just, are these equations actually correct on slide 37? I mean, the first one looks like a cancer one, the second one looks like a non-cancer one. I think, I, th I think they got switched. That's why everybody's confused. Go to slide 37. I mean, the first one looks to me like a cancer exposure dose, and the second one is what you would do for a non-cancer exposure dose. Yeah. Um, yeah. We 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 hear input and we definitely 
there's some potential error here that we will go back and definitely look at the equation in depth. I, w I wonder also whether I might consider adding an age group between 16 and 70. Um, when you look at, this is on slide, can't read the number, 36, I think. Uh, your little age group table with the exposure duration, it goes from 14 to 54. I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of hard to explain, you know, and you get to be, go from 15 to 16, you know, or actually 16's in both groups. So I guess that for 16, you can pick either number, but, you know, I mean, that wouldn't seem to be a tipping point from going from 14 to 54 right then. So maybe an, a thought about another group here would help help you think through some of these issues about what's different. And because I really, I think people are worried, I, most worried about young women, you know, in the study. I'm most worried about young women. And, um, and so, that maybe that would help. Thank you. So maybe we should move on to the dermal route of exposure. Okay, so final pathway, so dermal. So once again, here are the equations. They have the general. Better? Okay. Uh, so we have concentration, intake, and exposure time. So now we have um, the dermal exposure dose will depend on a bioaccessible concentration of the chemical in crumb rubber, um, particle loading onto the skin, and the area of exposed skin that will come into contact with the field, and the exposure time. Uh, so we already discussed the duration, averaging time, exposure time, and frequency. So, so the bioaccessible concentration of the chemical represents the amount that's available for absorption into the body. It will be measured in crumb rubber samples collected in the field study using artificial sweat and sebum biofluid extract. The absorption fraction parameter describes the amount that is absorbed across the skin. In the absence of chemical specific data, a WEHA will assume a value of one, and that 100% of the dermally bioaccessible concentration will be absorbed. The dermal load is a measure of the amount of particles that will adhere to the skin. Uh, it's derived by multiplying a weighted adherence factor times the exposed skin area times the event frequency. The event frequency describes the number of field events a field user may participate in in a day. A WEHA will assume a value equal to one. This assumes that users do not re-enter the field or enter another field at a later time of the day once particles have been washed off of the skin. The exposed skin surface area is normalized for body weight, is the amount of skin that's available for contact with crumb rubber particles. So this parameter is the sum of the fraction of body area for each exposed body part multiplied by the total body surface area over the body weight. So the fraction of total body surface area will vary with each body part. Um, fractions may change throughout childhood or through growth and into young adulthood, and they may vary based on age and gender. Values for this parameter were adopted from the EPA Exposure Factors Handbook. And although the exposed body parts may vary based on season and the type of uniform field users wear, such as shorts versus long pants or short versus long sleeves, a WEHA will assume that the total body surface area is available for exposure for athletes and young bystanders. This is based on anecdotal, anecdotal evidence from players that crumb rubber can get underneath the clothing. For coaches, referees, and adult bystanders, only the legs and arms, including the hands, are assumed to be exposed. So shown here is the data table for the percent of the total body surface area <coughs> for various body parts. We have the head, trunk, arms, hands, legs, and feet. And this table shown here represents the total body surface skin area skin areas available in the US EPA Exposure Factors Handbook. For both of these <coughs> parameters, values are gender and age specific. So back to this main equation, 
Uh, the final parameter is the weighted adherence factor, um, which describes the amount of crumb rubber adhered to the exposed skin. It's, this factor is a weighted sum that's based on the surface area of each exposed body part and the adherence factor for that specific body part. So due to physiological differences of the skin for certain body part areas, there may be differences in the adherence for different parts. Values for this parameter were taken from the Kissel et al. study that we discussed earlier. They measured particle loading onto skin for athletes on field um, with crumb rubber infill. Shown here are the factors for the body parts that they measured, the hands, arms, legs, face, and feet. This table here uh, shows the calculated weighted adherence factors that are based on the area of exposed skin. So for athletes and child bystanders, they're derived assuming the whole body is available. And for, for athletes, for adult bystanders, coaches, and referees, the arms and legs are assumed to be exposed. Values are age and gender specific. So this slide is just to quickly wrap up our discussion. So we just spent the morning, we discussed the exposure dose equations for the three main pathways. Oops. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so we talked about inhalation um, and the non the non-cancer exposure concentration and the cancer exposure dose. We also talked about the ingestion and dermal pathways and their non-cancer and cancer dose equations. So now we would like to get input on the panel on what we just heard. We have some questions here to help facilitate discussion. Many of them have come up already, so I'll turn uh, the discussion back over to Dr. Paul to facilitate. Did you want to comment about that? Dr. Zeiss and Dr. McCone had a little uh, discussion <laughs> yeah, about maybe. the, I'm, what slide is that? Well, so, so he's lo Tom's looking at the dermal, but I think in the ingestion, some of the confusion is that we didn't show the sigma and the summing up of doses over different age intervals. Maybe that was adding to the confusion in the dose calculation for chronic exposure, but maybe Debbie and I can talk offline and kind of try to resolve it with staff. Yeah, I think what Tom was pointing out, it looked like they just had the equations backwards. That was what I was trying to... Well, I'm, I'm still trying to get through. So if you go to slide 41, so a, a cancer exposure dose is typically uh, a, a lifetime equivalent dose, because that's the cancer potency. It has to be multiplied by cancer potency. So it would be milligram per kilogram body weight um, over a lifetime. So we have the crumb rubber... So I'm worried about is, let's see, the DL is dermal loading milligram per kilogram body weight day. But if you multiply that by the exposure time, hours per day, and the frequency days per week, um, you get hours per week, right? I mean, I guess I, I'm still having trouble following how that leads to a, uh, uh, the, what we would want for a cancer potency calculation. Same one, uh, same problem with the ingestion one. So I think some, so there are conversion factors in the equations. I didn't oh, go have. through each of them, what they are, because they're oh, not okay. all the same. The conversion each factors take yeah. care of getting us. Some of those conversion factors take into account. Going get, us, get us to a lifetime equivalent for those. Because okay. the units aren't going to come out unless the conversion factor, right? Because we have, um, Let's see, hours per day. And again, with the dose, what you want to be doing is you want to be waiting for the cancer side, the particular dose during that age period by the sensitivity factor. And then you take each okay. of the doses during the different age intervals and you sum them up after they've been weighted appropriately. So it's a little confusing. Try to wrap your mind all around it. We're just showing one. Uh, age segment, really. Yeah, I agree. Dr. Bennett. I have a, another question on the on the dermal. So it looks like on slide 45, we're calculating the dermal load, 
Um, are we, where do we look to see what's absorbed? Do we have things absorbed through the skin? And then I was confused by the event frequency, events per day. Are we certain, are we kind of assuming they have one practice? So here's the daily oh, 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 there it is, so okay. It has another step to go further and then we'll have the bioaccessibility concentration to plug in before we get to the absorption. And then how are we getting the event frequency, events per day? Wouldn't that just be one? We assume to be one because we assume that even they may have multiple games, they are not going to wash their hand okay. and then come back to the next game. So uh, that's all our practice is more like a continuous. So we assume a event per day, not necessarily a game per day. Dr. Sheldon. I've got a question. Um, so all of this assumes that the crumb, the tire crumb rubber is the vehicle for transmission. You don't have any, you know, so things have volatilized off the field, they've gone onto your skin, and there's a constant absorption through the skin. You have not included that. There's always the vehicle of the crumb rubber, is that right? We assume the relative contribution for the, the transmission through the vapor is lower than the actual adhesion. Okay. Uh, we consider that vapor pathway is lower, yeah. less predominant. You uh, might do a little back of the envelope calculation yes. just to make sure the assumption um, is, is correct. So on this, um, you know, concerns or, or other parameters needed. I guess to me the question is, is, um, you know, kids that do play soccer, do slide, do other things and they abrade their skin, um, is there anything to take into account that? And um, the other thing is, is that given the popularity of sunscreen now, does that do anything to adhesion factors? I mean, those are sort of, and I'm sure you're smiling like, of course, we've thought of this before. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, we're not sure the Kissel study was actually whether those participants wear sunblock or not. We are aware of that if you have sunblock or lotion on the skin, you do have more adhesion. Um, that's why we're putting up, it's like, help us out. Uh, the model itself is very complicated. We, we're not sure at this point how we can model it. I'm sure the literature search can help and listen to the input from the panel. That's why we're here. And um, the sunblock, the, uh, the abrasion. We heard a lot about the abrasion. We are aware of that. Uh, it's just serum is another very complex uh, uh, matrix. And we, we're gonna look at how can we measure the bioaccessibility of these rubber. And when we talk to player, we go to videotape, we see people abrasion. Uh, when we, we, it's not a comfort, but most of the player told us, if you got a cut, you got abrasion, you're supposed to clean it up, and you're supposed to get off the field according to requirement of coach. And we've seen player play for the game with bleeding knee. So that's something we are aware, we're looking for how we can model it. We, we're looking for how we can deal with this pathway. So over the last 15, 20 years of my career, we were always trying to do measurements of exposure and then relate it to biomonitoring data and see if we could get closure on anything. And you know, the biomonitoring data always showed higher levels of exposure for almost all chemicals. And I was always trying to figure out what was the exposure pathway I missed? What was the thing that I left out? And um, that's why I'm asking these questions. You know, if you finally get back to trying to close the loop, then the question is, is what might be the major contributors? And, you know, I think right now you just put a list of other major contributors, you know, if we ever go back to verifying, but it's always been this conundrum. We agree. <laughs>
I think Dr. McCone agrees too from previous work he did in terms of pesticide exposure. Uh, can, Mr. Ave, oh. Oh, okay. I, I just, I, Go ahead, I you gotta push it back on. If you, I mean, so I think the confusion that I had, so maybe others will have it too, is that in the inhalation, I mean the ingestion and the dermal exposure for the non-cancer you have ED exposure duration over averaging time, and early on when we talked about your protocol for doing cancer risk assessment, you also use ED and AT, but those are cancer related. And I think you can get around a lot of confusion by just maybe putting a subscript or superscript that a, the, in these later equations, this is the exposure duration you use for non-cancer, right? And the AT, that's what was hard for me because I, I see ED and AT, I'm always thinking cancer, because that's the way you introduced it. Those two terms were first used way back on slide something 21 to introduce the protocol for doing cancer risk assessment. <laughs> Um, yeah, so here, that's the general equation for cancer risk assessment. In a way, the, these EDs and ATs have a different meaning. In cancer, what you're trying to do is, is do a cumulative intake. So the top part of this equation is the cumulative intake uh, over an exposure duration, which you then normalize by the, the averaging time, typically lifetime. When you use it later on, you're looking at a non-cancer effect where you're trying to figure out uh, what's the appropriate exposure duration and averaging time for another kind of effect. I think you would be better served to use slightly different, or, or just even superscripts, right? C and NC, because you're using different assumptions and actually technically different EDs and ATs in both cases. That would help me a lot. So. Maybe I just get confused. We agree. I, oh, sorry. I think uh, Mr. Evolves next. We'll get back. So I I have a question and a comment actually, and this sort of reintroduces some comments that have been made earlier in a different vein, and that is this assumption on on uh, slide 42 about one event per day, and I think that's probably appropriate for uh, recreational sport players, but for any child playing on a club sport, for any high school athlete. Other athletes that are involved in tournaments, et cetera, they typically have multiple matches per day. And so I think one event per day undersells what the potential exposure is. Moreover, I think your assumption that after the match, they wash off the material and it sort of resets to zero is not quite correct because they may, they may or may not wash off the material, but in the course of, of participating in the match when they have multiple matches in a day, they may abrade the skin. And so now they've broken the initial external barrier of the epidermis. Uh, and so they now have a, a more potentially viable pathway for exposure. So resetting it to zero isn't quite, I think, what you want to do because they've already now surpassed the initial threshold. Now they go out and play again. They already have a raw opening. The only reason they get pulled off the field, which you mentioned before, is if they're outright bleeding, and then they'll be pulled off the field. But if it's just sort of torn up, they will play, and they will play with that scrape on. And I think then, then they're, being at, they're at a higher level of exposure, and I don't think you're capturing that in this multiple events. But Ed, do, do you have a suggestion about how they could do that? Well, I think that, again, I think this tends to underpredict what the exposure might be, so I think you you may want to either separate out recreational sports from competitive sports and calculate a value for either, for them two separately, and with regard to the competitive sports, I think this is gonna be a multiplicative factor of that. Whether If you cannot, uh, based on either the, the video or you know some other means, get some idea of how often this is likely to occur, to ascribe some frequency to it, I think you're gonna to have to put in some sort of safety factor, multiplicative factor, just to account for it and acknowledge that it exists because it does in fact exist. And if you ignore it, you're, you're avoiding what the true exposure is. Yeah, we, like we said, we, when we go to the videotaping, we saw people bleeding and they still play the whole game. So yeah, we, we are trying to capture and learn when we go to the field and put it back to this equation. 
I totally agree with you that that sport, especially club sports, they pay multiple games per day, and uh, we are not assuming that they, they play one game a day here. What we assume is that they don't wash their hand between games. So they will have the continuous, continuous loading. And of course, uh, we, we need to know more about how long they play, how many games they play per day for the club. Uh, I think that can help us uh, to, to have better gauge on their exposure. But again, once, I mean, once they participate in, in a match, and they've abraded the skin. We're not talking about the hands now, but maybe the forearms, the shins, et cetera. Once they've abraded now, that material may stay on or maybe new material introduced, but now it's in a different sort of milieu because now the, the first level of skin is sort of missing. So now they don't have to, you don't have to worry about that impervious barrier. Now you're already open and things are, I think you're in a different uh, dimension now. It probably is the kid that was playing 24 hours that's also <laughs> playing bleeding. <laughs> Um, Dr. Kyle's next, and then Dr. Bennett. Uh, I, I may have to ask your permission to bring up the subject of underwear. <laughs> but um, I, I don't know if this is in the exposure factor handbook. I bet not. But, um, <laughs> you know, um, in my experience and other women I know, a lot of the exposure is in your underwear and not your exposure skin because this stuff gets in your clothes and is held there. And so this whole idea of exposed skin versus not, I, I, I think it's gonna underpredict. Um, maybe less for men, because they have less constrictive underwear, I don't know, but and I don't wanna get too far into this in this forum, but I do think it's significant, or it could be significant, and we, I don't know if anybody's done anything on it. I, I know it's come up before. We have discussed this briefly at a past event. So um, I, I wish I had an exact suggestion, but I don't. But I think maybe um, more of the skin potentially is, um, Im is impacted by this material than what you're estimating from what you're calling exposed skin. Yeah, um, we, we talk to player and they do with your permission to talk about underwear. Uh, they do- You have my permission. <laughs> thank you. They do tell us that it get into my underwear, it get into my socks, into my shoes. That's why in our assumption here for dermal uptake, we assume the full body. Even though they're wearing long sleeve, wear licking, we assume the full body. These particles go through the skin. I was on the field. It went into my underwear too. So I, we, we are aware of that and we try to be on the protective side uh, to assume the full body uh, available to contact with these crumb rubber particles. Thank you for that clarification. Comment on that? Th there is a recent paper looking at the effect of clothing. Um, I'm blanking on the name, but I, Morrison. Hmm? Morrison. Morrison, Lynn Morrison did a study on the, uh, so, I mean, you could make your assumption and then show what he found about the relative attenuation by clothing. I don't think you should use, you know, say, oh, clothing's gonna be protective, but say this is what we assumed, and just to show that that is not way off base, here's what Glenn Morrison found in his study on the effects of clothing. Dr. Bennett. So, I mean, I feel like a big part of the problem well, I, I feel like some of what Dr. Aval was talking about in terms of the, the, the scratches and so forth, I feel like some of that's almost accounted for because they assume the fraction of absorbed across the skin is one, which seems really high to me. And so that's assuming that all the chemical that gets on the skin is going in. And so that seems like that would apply to a braided skin. But then on the flip side, the adherence factors of the crumb rubber to the skin seem super, super low because we know that there was a whole bunch of literature back from the 90s looking at moist skin versus dry skin and seen so much more adhering to moist skin. And then also, now suddenly it's under the sock. Well, it's going to adhere to the skin. It's got a sock pushing it up against the skin. Um, I'm going to use the sock example. And also, I'm just even puzzled, even on the... Kissel thing, the arm is an order of magnitude lower than any other body part in terms of the adherence factor. So I think that adherence factor has a big problem 
And then I'm a little bit confused because actually I don't see any references in terms of time. I mean, part of the reason I was kind of okay with the event frequency being event per day is it seems like there's just some amount of, of um, chrome rubber getting to the skin and it, it doesn't seem to have anything to do with how long you're out there or anything. I, I'm not even seeing how this dermal exposure is increased if you're there for several hours or just one hour. So I guess there's just, I have some just general confusion on the dermal and some specific concern about the adherence factors. So I may have a really bad thought. Um, this is Linda Sheldon, so let me let you know. I don't want anybody else to have this bad thought. Um, and the reason I think it might, I, so we talked about the fact that there may be things that we are really underestimating exposure on. And, um, you know, granted, you have to go with, you know, the best you can do with the kinds of exposure assessments and risk assessments that people do. Um, you know, you have spent so much time and effort, especially on the analytical portion and bringing state-of-the-art analytical techniques and doing all that in there. And then we've got this area where it's like, well, you know, we're just doing what we've always done because that's what we have to do. And, um, you know, it might be useful to look at what might be you know, even a separate section or a separate part that says, so here are some other potentially high exposure scenarios that, you know, he, we have not considered, and this might be what, you know, this could be estimated exposures. Um, to me, the good thing about it would be it would take into consideration all the thoughts and all the things that you have, you know, sort of put together in your mind, but it might give a quantification to it. Um, the other thing is, is that for a study that is this large and you have spent this much time and effort to it, I think it's important not just to address what is the study question, but to be building upon the science. And, you know, that section could say, so here are the things we couldn't address, here's what we've estimated. This might help other researchers build upon the science. Um, so those things would be good. The bad part about it may be is that you may be doing too much mea culpa, too much uncertainty, and it may negate what are the findings you have. But. Um, you know, it's a thought, it may be a bad thought, um, but it might bring into consideration some of these, these things we've been talking about. Any other comments, questions? Well, thank you, uh, Patty and Jocelyn. Uh, <laughs> I think we're scheduled to take a lunch break now. Um, and should we be back at, back at one, one o'clock? So uh, for those uh, online, we'll be taking a break for the next uh, hour and eight minutes. But we'll start promptly at one. Thank you all.